On time for lunch. Uh, so we'll, I want to finish what I was discussing in terms of Monte Carlo sampling. And we'll get ourselves started on the tutorial. And then in the second more informal tutorial slot in the afternoon, we'll have plenty of time, I think, to finish this, this tutorial for today. So what we're discussing now is how we efficiently choose samples distributed according to this probability distribution, which means how do we choose these updates um, in our Markov chain? How to choose, say, x, k plus 1 from x of k in Markov chain Monte Carlo, such that such that the data set D is distributed correctly according to P of X, which is the distribution of interest. <clears throat> so let me change notation a little bit. Let me call X K plus 1 with an index nu and x of k with an index mu. And k and k plus 1 are such that they lie adjacent to each other somewhere in this Markov chain. What we need to define is a, a, dis, a, a probability distribution okay, that we call the transition probability that tells us how to transition from x of k to x of k plus 1, or from mu to nu. Transition probability <coughs> um, T, I'll call it mu arrow nu. So that transition probability should in principle be able to take any state in the Markov chain and be able to tell you, you know, the probability at, you know, uh, the distribution at which you should be choosing uh, the next state. So fundamentally, Markov chain Monte Carlo is, has this stochasticity in, in its sampling. This is not a deterministic procedure. You can imagine other <laughs> methods of producing samples that is deterministic, but so fundamentally we're looking at a probability, or we're defining a probability, which makes this, uh, again, stochastic or random. <clears throat> so this probability has to be greater than or equal to zero. It should be normalized, such that starting from any point in the Markov chain, the probability of exiting that configuration to another one sums to unity, and so on. <clears throat> so in order for uh, our data set to be distributed correctly, the procedure by which we uh, update according to this transition probability can be derived according to two conditions. And these conditions are designed so that the act of importance sampling, um, again, gives us a data set that's distributed correctly. So you might have heard of these before. The first condition is what's called detailed balance. And the second is ergodicity. I'm going to talk, bad choice of words, 
I'm going to talk in detail, no, about detail balance. Um, let me just mention ergodicity briefly. It'll come up again in these lectures. Ergodi er ergodicity is basically the concept that every single mu must be connected somehow by our updating procedure to every single new. And again, the procedure we're defining is this arrow here. So we must, you know, in our Markov chain, there must be a path, there must be a way of producing a chain that connects every single configuration somehow to every other configuration. So there's no isolated points of configuration space. Because now that we're not sampling uh, according to a uniform random distribution, because we're doing this procedure, where x2 is based on x1, x3 is based on x2, we have to ensure that we enforce, enforce this, and it's called ergodicity. Every um, I'll leave it purposely vague. What does it mean to connect? I mean, you can imagine if, that you have very long Markov chains that connect different configurations and so on. I think generally the idea is that, you know, you, mu must connect every new, you know, say in sub-exponential time or something like that. <coughs> so I'm not going to say anything else about ergodicity. It's, it's difficult to prove, uh, but it's, it's, it's a necessary condition for uh, sampling. But let's talk, to, talk about detailed balance. So detailed balance is the idea that the rates into and out of uh, different configurations are somehow balanced, they're somehow equal. Okay, so... Question? Blue is not visible? Minus one for everyone in the other room. <laughs> That's hilarious. I hope they can see it. <laughs> okay, so that's very good to see. Every mu must connect every mu. Detail balance. So detail balance is a condition on how we transition into and out of um, uh, different configurations. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll say, <coughs> Okay, so I'll just say detail balance will sample the correct stationary distribution, the correct distribution that we're aiming for, say I'm calling which I'm calling P of X. Um, if when we transition from mu to nu, the transition probability. out of that mu times the probability that we've you know initially landed in that mu is equivalent to sort of the converse the ch the probability that we've landed in nu and the trans and the transition probability out of it did i get that right yes <coughs> so as a ratio the ratio of transition probabilities has to equal the ratio of probabilities in this way. This is typically how we derive expressions for the transition probabilities and it depends on this ratio of probabilities that presumably we know. Okay, so we're... Okay, I'll keep it in black. For this, the purposes of this um, part of the lecture, we know these. Okay, so <clears throat> for example, in the case of the Boltzmann distribution, you know, because it's an exponential, you see how these ratio of transition probabilities depends on the difference in energy of the two configurations. So that's sort of a nice physical example. So T mu to nu. Did I do this right? Nu to mu. 
Okay, so we know, say, the Boltzmann distribution for this case, right, and, and for this case. So I want P of nu, so that's e to the minus of beta e nu over z, and z over e to the minus beta e mu. So the partition functions, even though they're complex objects, uh, cancel. And we will use this extensively in our tutorial. E. Hope you can see that. So the difficulty isn't necessarily in uh, deriving you know, this ratio of transition probabilities. It's really what is the process by which we, we jump between these different states that satisfies uh, this condition called detailed balance. Okay. So <coughs> let's answer that question now with a certain one certain solution for this algorithm. So what is the appropriate process? The thing that I was calling the arrow there. <coughs> okay, so this, in general, there's no sort of unique solution for this process, uh, which, will, which will satisfy detailed balance. Um, and in fact, you know, you can have algorithms that have uh, you know, pros and cons. Uh, you can have algorithms that are very local, that say flip a single spin, but result in configurations that are highly correlated. You can have other processes defined by this arrow, which flip global clusters and all sorts of loop structures or all sorts of crazy things you can think about, which may be more difficult to implement, but it'll give you more highly independent samples. So, you know, kind of the art and the state of the art in terms of de designing your Markov chain Monte Carlo really goes into this procedure of, of choosing these arrow, you know, choosing that arrow, that process, which satisfies detail balance. So one design trick, I'll call it, is to split the transition probability up. So let me take T mu to nu, and I'll split it up into what I'm calling a selection probability and an acceptance ratio. So G mu to nu, is a selection probability, and A is the acceptance ratio. The selection probability tells you how you target nu. So sitting in mu, which is x, k, so it's that image or it's that vector of binary Eisen configurations, What's the probability that I target some other configuration? Once I've targeted that other configuration, A is the uh, you know, probability uh, at which I accept it. Hence, acceptance ratio. OK, so let's derive the procedure or algorithm for updating configurations. Uh, for the specific case of, say, a Boltzmann distribution. And let me think again of the Ising model. Where I have a configuration mu is xk some x1, x2, xi, xn for n qubits or n spins. <clears throat> and as a target, you know, let me imagine selecting this site index i at random and then flipping that spin. Okay, so again, this has some configurations of ups and downs or plus and minus ones or whatever we're calling them. Minus one, one. Maybe this is one here. Maybe this is minus one, whatever. So let me imagine designing an update 
that is a single spin flip. which takes this and flips it to minus one. So you can imagine choosing the, the site index i at random. And the target state mu is, uh, you know, x of k with x i gone to minus x i. <clears throat> so the role of the algorithm, which the, the process, now becomes whether or not I accept or reject that proposed target, right? So if you pr propose something crazy, maybe something that violates detailed balance, you want to make sure that your a is zero. Okay, but if you propose something that makes a lot of sense, maybe lowers the energy, then you want that A to be essentially one. And in fact, you want to design algorithms typically, number one, that have as high of an acceptance ratio as possible, but that also give you highly uncorrelated samples. Right, so that means you're, if, if you have a lot of correlation, your data set might have to be bigger to get a good estimator. If you have a small amount of samples that are highly uncorrelated, uh, pr presumably, you can find the minimum size data set to produce your estimator. <clears throat> so this choice of this site, at, you know, randomly choosing this site, gives us a very simple selection probability. Because I've just chosen at random, this is essentially 1 over n for any uh, mu or nu, or any x to the k. Right, throw a dice, you'll do this in your tutorial, select a site at random, that gives you the transition, uh, sorry, the selection probability. The goal is now to use detail balance to, to derive an equation for the acceptance ratio. Okay. So to make a long story short as possible, the ratio of transition probabilities, which we know, did I write it somewhere? I'll write it out. Okay, looks like that. Keep this in mind. This is p of nu over p of mu. Okay. So, well, okay, I'll write it here. But now we can insert our expression for g. And that should give us a ratio of acceptance ratios. Sounds weird. There's our G's. They'll cancel. And we know, again, if we're dealing with an Ising model in thermal equilibrium, that this ratio uh, is given by a Boltzmann distribution. <coughs> So this will just give us an uh, expression for the ratio of acceptance ratios. That's e to the new minus e to the new. Okay, we're not quite done because we need to decide how much of this to split between the, the numerator and the de denominator in principle. Right? And to do that, we uh, invoke you know, uh, a physical principle uh, for our algorithm, which is that we hope that we can uh, accept uh, configurations which lower the energy. Right? So in general, you know, the physical principle of, what is it, minimum action, 
I guess, dictates that you want to minimize a free energy in principle. Right? What, we have ex what we have access to here is an internal energy, this E. So if we minimize the internal energy, then this, uh, this algorithm should also uh, give us enough power that we basically minimize a free energy naturally. To uh, say allow this, you can make a cho choice. Choose that if the configuration E new is what? Less than, let's see if I can screw this up, E new, then the acceptance ratio, ratio of new to mu is always accepted. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody check it for me. It's okay? I think it's okay. <coughs> I think it's okay. It's new to mu, mu, mu to new here, right? I've just decomposed it, and it's this, the ratio's opposite there. Yeah. Okay? So now, if I've lowered the energy by this process, I'm going to accept that all the time. That's a choice I make. But now that constrains this algorithm, so that in that scenario, you know, where uh, mu is of lower energy than nu, then the acceptance ratio going the other way has this Boltzmann factor in it. <clears throat> what that means is when I raise the energy, okay, there's uh, you know, a, prob a probability that I accept and a probability that I reject. And I accept with this probability. So again, the algorithm becomes stochastic. I roll a dice, I compare the, you know, that dice, <laughs> which, which is a dice that is a continuous uh, distribution between 0 and 1. I compare it to this probability. Okay. That's called the Metropolis algorithm. It actually took many years to sort of uh, settle on exactly this form for the Metropolis algorithm. This is the form that we'll use in the tutorial today. Okay. The I can I can give you a sort of more precise expression um, for the Metropolis algorithm that doesn't necessarily depend on the Boltzmann distribution. So let me call that the generalized metropolis algorithm. That's A, let me get these indices right. <coughs> Mu to nu is the minimum of you know, oops, so it's the minimum of this ratio P of nu, transition from nu to mu, and the sort of converse in the denominator. Okay, so here I hope I've motivated the Metropolis alg algorithm in this specific case. This is what I'm calling a generalized version. Okay. And I want to um, digress momentarily uh, from this strict example of the Ising model that we're going to deal with today. And I want to talk about this generalized version of the Metropolis algorithm that we're going to use on Thursday when we discuss generative modeling with restrictive Boltzmann machines. Okay, so another case, so you can imagine this is sort of one special case of this formula here. It's one way to design an algorithm uh, that produces 
uh, you know, a data set that's distributed according to this probability distribution. Okay, that's one way of thinking about it. That generalized version doesn't satisfy necessarily the immunization of energy, maybe? It does because this, this is the case one here, right? And then this is the other because case. What if you, I mean, the probability that you want to sample has a mean with a specific energy different than zero, then maybe you don't want to minimize the energy, but to get to that particular energy, right? So you can have a minimum of energy that's not zero, and this will still work. I mean, that your probability distribution that you want to sample has a mean. A mean. A mean oh, sorry. Yeah, which is not <coughs> with energy equal to zero. Then minimization of energy is not like what you want. Okay, to sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so th th I think the principle that we chose uh, for case one there basically assumes that we have this, uh, you know, minimization of the action or whatever it's called. But there's, there's many other versions. Let me put it that way. Let me talk about another specialized case of this. Which is for relevant for the R restricted Bolson machine on Thursday. And this is called Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling and Metropolis sampling are often uh, considered very different. But this formula here, which I've tried to motivate, is a way of connecting the two. Let me put it that way. So if you see Gibbs sampling, it's nothing to be scared of. All it is is uh, a sampling with conditional probabilities. So the idea is you can imagine uh, proposing an update on some subset of the spins conditioned on the state of the others. You know, and in some, say, in, some in some sense you're already doing that here. You're proposing an update of this spin that's conditioned on everything else, right? Conditioned. So that's kind of the important word. Conditional probabilities, you can, you can formalize. So maybe this is a review, maybe not. But a conditional probability I, I just write like this with a horizontal bar here. This is the probability of A given B. Ugh, big A. A given B. Okay, the probability of A, this probably makes sense, is the idea that you, if you trace out all possible configurations of B in the joint distribution, you're only left with uh, a, a function defined over A. So this is marginalized, or the marginal distribution. And marginalized for us means trace. So I'm just relating, you know, a probability to a conditional probability, <coughs> or sorry, to a joint probability that's been traced over. So that P of A comma B, that's kind of the probabilities that we're used to dealing with. It's the probabilities over the whole ensemble. It's called the joint probability. And the relationship between the joints and the marginals is given by the so-called product rule. So P um, be conditioned on a P of A. That's just an exercise in what's called conditional probability distributions. <coughs> okay, so when we have all the Ising spins together and we have a, a Boltzmann distribution, that's kind of the joint distribution. What I'm, what I'm asking you to imagine now is that I pick a subset of those Ising spins and let me call it um, you know, A and let me propose an update on A while holding B fixed. 
then that means that the, you know, the G in my algorithm is this conditional probability. It's the probability of a new configuration of A with B fixed. So let me go back to my previous notation and I'm just going to use the rules of conditional probabilities to def uh, define what we call Gibbs sampling using this generalized uh, metropolis update or metropolis algorithm. So it's back to say Ising variables uh, x. So this is my mu equals x of k say. It's a bunch of variables. I'm going to take x of i and I'm going to treat it specially. I'm going to pull it out and calculate a conditional probability. So the algorithm, the update, uh, very generally now, is to just replace this variable right, with, with some other variable drawn from the conditional. Its value is still either plus one or plus one or minus one for the Ising model, right? But what we're going to do is draw that according to the conditional. So what I'm going to call you're going to hate this P X I condition on the values of all the other uh, variables in this list with i omitted. Okay, so that's just notation. Okay, so it's like I said, I'm conditioning my probability of choosing plus one or minus one based on the values of everything else. You see how it's very similar to what I've been doing before? I'm just formalizing this in a, in a different way um, with, the, with these expressions for conditional probabilities. So now my G, right, which is my, um, what the hell did I call it? <coughs> update probability is this conditional. So I'm going from say mu to nu. Mu is my original vector here. Nu will be the one with this replaced according to that conditional probability. So I'll just call this P X I right which is my new value, x minus i, vector, which is that vector of all of the other values with index i omitted. If this isn't confusing, these are unchanged. So this conditional probability of the new value of spin i is also equal to the conditional probability condition on all the new values. So in that step from mu to nu, this arrow only xi changes. And in fact, you can imagine Metrop uh, you know, Metropolis Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms where instead of a single spin, so that should not be a vector, Instead of a single spin, I can imagine having two subsets, right? This could be a vector or a, a subset of more than one spin. And in fact, we'll see this in Thursday when we talk about the restricted Bolson machine. So a curiosity of the conditional probabilities in this case is the expression for uh, the acceptance ratios uh, uh, given these things. Okay, so this is, let's see, P. This is the conditional probabilities. This is my G. So let's also note that in that expression we need the, the uh, marginalized distributions, or sorry, the joint distributions. So let me say P of nu using this product rule.
which I'm just defining like this now. This is the full, um, do I like that notation? Sure. This is the full vector. Is the conditional. P, X, I times a joint. So I've just used uh, sort of the product rule here. Uh, and I did this wrong because that has to be the marginalized one there. <coughs> Is that right? Did I do that right? Now to derive this, all I got to do is drop in an expression for P of nu and P of mu using that. And I already know what these are. These are the conditionals. And you can do it yourself and see what you get. But that ratio, P of nu, P of mu, So let me write the first part like this. And then this is my G's. And I've taken advantage of the fact that the, you know, all the other states that I've labeled by minus I don't change. Now I'm deriving this thing here. Let me just leave it on there. And let me substitute in this expression here. So you'll see. Looks like this finally killed my marker. Now let's see if I did that right. This in the numerator is the same as this. This in the numerator. Or, sorry. Yeah, this thing right here is the same as this expression here. So you're left with the ratio uh, of these two terms. But remember, what I've done is I've updated site i, and this is the vector of everything except i, right? So these two things are the same. I can, I can change the label from mu to nu here, or vice versa. So the acceptance ratio in this case uh, will always be equal to 1. And so that's just a nice feature of Gibbs sampling. So this is in Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling is just a different type of metropolis sampling in some sense, where you've changed the expression for G from something that's completely uniform and random to something that's conditional. Okay? We're not going to use it today, but you're going to use this on Thursday. So this is essentially how Bolton machines, uh, which are a type of generative model, um, are, are sampled. Any questions on this? I suspect that's something you haven't seen before, even if you've seen Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So I want to go. I, I want to go back to um, the the original Metropolis algorithm for the Ising model, and what we'll do in the next ten minutes is just discuss what we're going to do in the tutorial, and then we're going to break out our laptops and start exploring these algorithms, and then we'll uh, finish up with that after lunch. 
you always accept and you select only according to whether no, you, you simply replace the i coordinate or, or the i set. You replace the i value with something that's drawn according to that conditional distribution. That's it. Once you do that, you accept it with, with acceptance ratio, ratio one. Yeah. And again, it's different than the original Metropolis we looked at because you, yeah, you have a uniform distribution where you kind of pick at random, but then the acceptance, you know, you can have an acceptance or a rejection step. So how the rejection works in the Gibbs, the Gibbs sampling algorithm is you may have configurations of certain variables that basically never get chosen because the conditional probability is very low. So that's all it is, is it's kind of changing this conditional probability into a different part of the, of the algorithm. It's mind-bottling. Like your mind's all bottled up. Okay, we're going back to the Ising model. What are we doing with our lives? So, this is the tutorial. Again, 2D Ising. Um, you'll have an energy. Maybe I wrote it with a H. I forget. I'll put a J in there because there's a J in your code. <coughs> this is all bonds on a lattice. Um, typically, we set J equals to one. The lattice. Here's a lattice here, actually. So let me draw a 4x4 four four lattice. In two dimensions. That sum runs over every bond, which is that's supposed to be a J, which is the label, say, IJ here, or you know, IJ here, say. So for every site, you can convince yourself that there's two bonds. There's two. There's two, there's two. I'm also periodic, so here's one, here's two. And this site here is this site here. Same with up here, I have two bonds per site. All right, this site here is this site here. Does that make sense? That'll be your, you'll have a data structure for that. Uh, we're gonna update mu to nu with a Metropolis single spin flip. Algorithm. Um, the first thing you'll do is you'll look at the expression for the energy, which in its sort of full naive form has this sum over all bonds, again, which is 2 to the n. Uh, sorry, 2 times n bonds. <coughs> But you'll see with a single spin flip metropolis update, uh, updating that energy every time is kind of overkill because if I have four sites here in my lattice with four bonds and I, and I flip this site I, you'll see that I only affect the local part of the lattice. So you'll be looking at the change in energy locally for a single spin flip. I'll show you in a minute on the projector. The goal will be to calculate estimators. Uh, expectation values of, say, the energy, magnetization. We'll calculate the specific heat. And we'll also calculate the susceptibility. So we know the specific heat, uh, which is beta squared. E squared minus E squared. The susceptibility is beta times, I haven't derived this, but you can do it for fun tonight, is the mean squared fluctuation of the magnetization. And as I'll explain later, we use the absolute value here. Let me get back to that. So we're going to calculate uh, these four estimators. And we're going to do it with the goal of seeing a phase transition. So 
So in the 2D Ising model, there's two distinct phases in the thermodynamic limits. So if I draw a phase diagram, that is basically the only free parameter left uh, in the free energy, say, which is the temperature. <coughs> it looks such, looks like this. So, so here's temperature or T over J. Um, all I'm going to say is a label, and you're going to explore what these labels mean. And one label is ferromagnetic and one is paramagnetic. The ferromagnetic or low temperature, so if this is t equals zero here, low temperature state is basically defined by a low energy all spins up or all spins down. So if you've taken stat mech or condensed matter, you know that in the thermodynamic limit, which means when the number of qubits n goes to infinity, you spontaneously select one of these two states. But you'll explore how these states are selected in the tutorial. So the magnetization, or maybe the absolute value of the magnetization per spin should be one here. Where the magnetization, I'll just do it like this, is defined as sum over i from one to n Sigma I. Right? Here, you should have a magnetization in the paramagnetic phase that averages a zero. <clears throat> and the absolute value is because you might get two of these states contributing, so I could also look at the absolute value of the magnetization here. This point is the phase transition. It's a sharp distinction between these two labels, or these two phases. And TC over J is 2.269. Do I have the exact expression? I think it's in your tutorial worksheet. No, I wrote it down. 2 over log 1 plus root 2. The Onsager temperature, 2.269 in units of J. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore the transition between these two states numerically. And what you'll do is you'll calculate things like the average magnetization per spin as a function of temperature for various discrete temperature points. And you'll see something that turns on at Tc and should saturate at a value of 1. And actually here, you might see some finite size remnant, but basically should saturate in thermodynamic limit to a value of m equals 0. So these estimators, which you're going to calculate from the data set produced by Monte Carlo, are the things which you know, basically tell you, in this case, uh, what the two labels are. So one of the interesting philosophies of machine learning is whether or not we can replace some of these estimators in Monte Carlo with something like supervised learning that you're going to learn about tomorrow, which is just uh, a way of assigning these labels uh, not, th not directly through uh, you know, a physically sort of relevant estimator, but through something like a feed-forward network or some other type of classifier, okay? So as we go forward from today, I mean, all of this is sort of conventional, if you will, statistical mechanics or condensed matter physics. Uh, what we're going to think about is how we kind of replace paradigms of calculation that we've developed over, you know, decades with other paradigms that have come more recently out of machine learning, okay? So let's look at magnetization, uh, energy, susceptibilities. We look at all these conventional estimators now in our Monte Carlo code. Um, and uh, basically uh, sort of hash out this phase diagram before we move on tomorrow. So I'm going to pause here before we uh, start our tutorial and take questions. Uh, questions from you guys and also questions from the other room. I don't know how that's going to work. So let's start with you guys. Any questions? Right, so the question is how do you know that you're converging to the right stationary distribution? I didn't actually derive detailed balance, uh, but that's one of the conditions that you need to satisfy. And it's, it's, it's basically 
uh, balancing the rate equation into and out of different configurations. Oh, wait, okay. but so not, I, I understand that because if you tell balance, you converge eventually to the right. The question is, the problem is the eventually part. The right. question is eventually, right. So there's, there's two answers to that. One is the fact that you have to be ergodic in, uh, you know, I, I just vaguely define the concept of ergodicity, uh, which is the concept that every mu has to be connected to every nu. Okay, so you, and, but, you know, you can refine that definition a little bit more. So what does eventually mean? It means that, you know, in, say, the time of the universe, you sample all possible configurations in reasonable computational time, you sample all possible configurations in sub-exponential time, perhaps. So there's many different, I think, um, definitions of, of eventually, of what you called eventually. And for us, I think it's very practical. Uh, you know, the, the time it takes to explore phase space or configuration space grows with the amount of qubits or the amount of uh, lattice points. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll converge uh, these estimators in a reasonable time on your laptop for a small system size, then we increase the system size, and so on and so on. And basically at some point, you know, within reasonable resources, you won't be able to converge. And that's, that's a very practical definition of, of how, uh, how we do these things. So we tend to do them systematically, starting from small sizes and increase, cr increasing. And what you're looking for, the goal will be the thermodynamic sort of value of this. The thermodynamic value when n goes to infinity might look something like this. You know. Do we get there? That depends. Other questions? What did you write to that? The minimization energy is getting the heat setting. Because you don't use that in the argument to get the acceptance ratio equal to one. Well, you use it somehow in, in this expression for the fact that you have a minimum and, a, and another term. But yeah, so it's not directly, so I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I haven't thought of exactly the motivation for this form of the Gibbs sampling. Uh, but I think the fact that you have a ratio of acceptance ratios, for lack of a better word, uh, and you have to choose, you have to make a choice about what the value of the numerator or the denominator is. There we made a choice of the denominator, uh, the fact that, um, you know, if you lower the energy, you, you have an acceptance rate of ratio of one. And this also appears in this generalized expression. So I, I don't think I have a better answer than that off the top of my head. There's, it's also possible, I believe, to have Gibbs sampling that doesn't uh, use exactly this, this expression. So this is, you know, there's a long history to these types of rejection algorithms. Uh, yeah, I think they, they didn't even strictly converge until the 1970s with this famous paper by Hastings. So, you know, even though Metropolis sampling was sort of derived in the 50s. You know, some of these things weren't fully fleshed out until the 70s. So I think there's a lot of different options, but these are the ones, this is the form I think we're going to use in this uh, school. I have a question. Well, in this, in this case, and this connects to Mauricio's problem, we have a very small system size. It's mm -hmm. only 16 like that, sites. Sure. So as we increase, for example, the number of sites, we would like to do it, would it be, like, let's say, for instance, uh, a very good technique that instead of using a single spin flip to say multiple spin flips, for example, a pack of spin flips, so that we can get into an acceptance ratio which is which actually samples the uh, phase space more efficiently. So that's yeah, absolutely. So the best case scenario is that every adjacent configuration in your Markov chain is completely independent, measured by some autocorrelation function, right? So what you, which autocorrelation is just the correlation between, you know, step k and step k plus whatever, j. Um, so in principle, you do want algorithms that are non-local. You can imagine why. Because if you do a single spin flip, you're highly correlated. Yeah, so true. In, in reality, what you do is you design these algorithms uh, as, I would say, as non-local as possible. Uh, so that you get independent configurations, but you still have a high acceptance rate, maybe on this side. Uh, so in particular, when you... When you traverse this transition, the, um, it, you know, it's well known that single spin flips give you an exponential slowdown in, in the uh, exploration time of configuration space. Exponential in the number of sites. So there's a type of algorithms which are called cluster algorithms. You might have heard of Swenson Wang or Wolf algorithms, which actually reduce the complexity of the sampling from exponential to polynomial. 
And there's, there's specifically sort of highly designed uh, you know, updates to get around this. So actually, in general, again, the art of the state of the art is really designing algorithms that give you a high acceptance rate or high acceptance ratio, uh, but um, also give you highly independent samples.